Welcome to everybody on Zoom for our 11th seminar of the Aphasia CRE seminar series. I'm Michelle Attard, one of the co-facilitators of the series. La Trobe University acknowledges that this event and our participants are located on the lands of many traditional custodians in Australia. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and we value their unique contribution to the university and wider Australian society. We're committed to providing opportunities for Indigenous Australians, both as individuals and communities, through teaching and learning and research and community partnerships across all our campuses and online. We pay our respects to Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining us online today. We would also like to acknowledge the difficult time of COVID-19 for everyone around the world. We're thinking of healthcare staff in our hospitals and communities, serving patients, clients, and families. Now, before I formally introduce our speaker for today, let's cover some housekeeping. Please be patient with us and the technology today. We're set to have a, a great number of participants joining us, Richard. Our apologies in advance if there are any disruptions to your viewing. Um, occasionally we have some late attendees and so on. So um, just make sure as, you, as we're going along that your microphone remains muted and your video is turned off. And um, you can minimise your Zoom gallery so that you can view the slides as clearly as possible. Thanks. Next slide, please. Well, I will um, need to uh, learn the trick of how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a minute. Uh... Perhaps your, ah, your keyboard button. Has that worked? Um, yes, moved, lovely. That's moved on for me, yeah, okay. Beautiful. So this seminar is being recorded on Zoom and it'll be available to access along with all our past webinar videos via the CRE seminar website. So just go to the resources tab. We usually upload the videos one to two weeks after each seminar. Also, a reminder that the CRE has developed a repository of aphasia-friendly COVID-19 resources, and these um, have been sourced from all across the world, and you're welcome to use these resources in your practice. Next slide. Apologies. Thank you. Can you see this? Our, I think we've lost our slide. Ah, I will try again. Okay, we're up to number three. How's that? Can you hear? No, I can hear a little whoop sound that shows it's <laughs> not happy with you. Perhaps try your right arrow button. There we go. All right. Questions for this seminar will be aided by the use of Slido. So you can log on anonymously or with your name. And this is how um, you get to ask Richard a question. Our event code is aphasia CRE. So just enter your question under the questions tab anytime throughout the presentation and you'll be able to see questions asked by the other audience members as well. You can click a thumbs up button to show um, which questions you're particularly interested in, and then this way they'll jump to the top. Um, so we'll try and get through as many questions as we can in the time we have. Next slide, thank you. Please also engage with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. Feel free to tweet along today and use the hashtag aphasiacre. And we welcome you to join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE. We invite people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers, and organisations to join our community of practice. <laughs> Benefits to members include a monthly newsletter, updates about events and activities, contributions to research, 
networking opportunities and more. Finally, the CRE is always looking for financial support, so if you wish to donate, please see our website for details. Next slide. So I'm really pleased to introduce Professor Richard Lindley to you today. Richard is an academic geriatrician with an interest in stroke, aphasia and clinical trials. He's based at the University of Sydney with two days a week in clinical practice, serving in acute geriatric medicine, stroke and rehabilitation. And I understand that his gorgeous background there is of the hospital where he works. Now, Richard and some colleagues have recently challenged some established views on dementia. And in this seminar, he'll outline why the medical research community might have gotten it wrong, what the implications may be for aphasia management and what the way forward could be. Thank you so much, Richard, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to share some thoughts that might be of interest to those of you involved in aphasia research and aphasia in clinical practice. So dementia, as you all are aware, is a growing global health problem. So in this talk, I'm first of all going to start with a health warning. Uh, and the health warning is I'm not a dementia researcher. So you might ask, well, why am I even giving this talk? Well, that might become apparent as we go forward. So I'm going to give you some background to the situation and then just tell you a story about my clinical research mismatch problem. I'm going to outline some epidemiology and some traps in the epidemiology and then present the new paradigm for you. And then this is really to open up a discussion about what the relevance of this new paradigm could be for how we think about the contribution of aphasia to dementia. I love this quote from Dr. Burwell, who was the Dean of the Harvard School of Medicine. Half of what we're going to teach you is wrong and half of it is right. Our problem is that we don't know which half is which. And I like this quote because it really has been true for my medical training over, over the years. I qualified in 1986 and an awful lot of what was established practice when I qualified has turned out to be untrue. And this may be the case now, which is a bit frightening. But let's talk about dementia. So when I emerged from medical school as a young, young doctor in the 1980s, this was our teaching. In fact, there's really only two major causes of dementia discussed, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. But shortly after I qualified, my Newcastle upon Tyne colleagues um, formalized the concept of dementia with Lewy bodies, the same pathological process that you get with Parkinson's disease. And there are other rarer causes of dementia. But let's go back to Alzheimer's disease and just perhaps look at the case that precipitated the presentation of dementia and the naming of this disease. This patient wasn't an old lady with a typical dementia. This was a 50-year-old woman. And she actually had some rather more unusual features with the uh, paranoia, progressive sleep, memory disturbance, aggression and confusion, and died five years later. And key part of this was on the pathology of the brain. There were the distinctive plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which are still the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease as described today. But where are we? There's been hundreds of failed trials in Alzheimer's disease, and Mater et al. discussed the reasons for this. It could be that we're just intervening too late in the disease. We may have the wrong dose of drug, we might have incorrect biology, and we're going to come back to the biology. 
And we know there's very poor trial measurement. And this is possibly quite relevant to aphasia with large day-to-day -day variability in patients and, and poor inter-observer agreement of, of outcomes. So let me take you on a little trip in Sydney. This is where most of you would land at the airport. But if you go west, you'll come across a depression in the city basin, which has been there for many centuries and is now Prospect Reservoir. The road along this depression used to be where the Aboriginal communities lived, and it was called Blacktown Road. And the suburb that's developed above to the north of this reservoir is now Blacktown. And my background that I use on my Zoom is actually the foyer of the new Blacktown Hospital, which is a fabulous facility, uh, really lovely wards, and uh, had consumer involvement in the design, which is a message for us all in terms of research. And here's the foyer, which is, I think, the picture I use in my background. So let me take you to my clinic. I'm a bit of an old fashioned geriatrician, I'm getting a bit older myself, and I like to do a geriatric medicine clinic. I don't do a specialized clinic. I just see geriatric medicine patients. And that's because I think holistic assessment is key to geriatric medicine. But what I've observed in my clinic over the years is that the denepazole, which is one of the medications we can use to improve people's memories. I've tried it in many people, but it only seems to work in the younger, robust patients. And typically with a minimal status exam score, maximum score of 30, you can normally increase people by about two points with this sort of successful medication. Most of my patients, however, were not the younger single problem patients but the frail older patients and when i tried to classify their dementia the really the only obvious answer to most of them is it's mixed because i've got a typical history of alzheimer's disease but i look in the brain scan and there's lots of white matter abnormality or infarction they may be a bit cogwheely which suggests a bit of parkinsonism maybe They've often had a hard life out in the west of Sydney and had far too much alcohol over the years. And I worry about the alcohol and they've had pretty rough childhood, some of them as well. Curiously though, I noted that for many of these frail older patients with what we do in the clinic, comprehensive geriatric assessment and management, I could often improve their mini mental status exam by about two points. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, as I said before, it's the holistic assessment of the patient. A new patient in my clinic takes an hour because it's a full history, a full social history, a full examination from top to toe, and some key tests. And what's the management part of geriatric assessment? Well, it's a bit of everything. Fine-tuning medication, lots of de-prescribing of the toxins, the benzos, the major tranquilizers, the, the drugs with you know, cholinergic side effects. It's all about optimizing their heart failure treatment. Large number of them are vitamin B12 deficient because of atrophic gastritis, so we treat that. And to put it simply, and you've heard me talk about this mantra, it's treating the treatable and doing the simple things well, but a lot of them, a lot of simple things arranging social care so they're clean and well fed, arranging daycare so people have got some socialization, planning for the future with enduring power of attorney and protecting the general public by stopping them driving at an appropriate time. So let's have a look at the epidemiology of dementia. Now, the one paper you should all have a look at is the Lancet Commission on Dementia, freely available at the Lancet, Livingston et al. They comment that 50 million people have dementia globally at the moment, to, to increase to 150 million by 2050. But the epidemiology is curious, and I hope some of you can see this slide. 
there's a genetic component of an APOE epsilon four is the one that probably contributes seven percent of attributable estimated population attributable fraction. Then there's the early life experience, and we know that adverse childhood experiences can predispose you to later dementia. Education comes out time and time again. In midlife, hearing loss seems to be very important, hypertension less so, obesity measurable, but perhaps only a small influence. And in late life, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, diabetes comes up. So when you put all that together, about a third is potentially modifiable, but two thirds is not. And that uh, is really where we are with the epidemiology. But I just want to talk a little bit now about obesity and physical inactivity. I'm sure a lot of you have heard on social media, in particular, the fact that keeping physically active is going to prevent your dementia. But what if dementia actually causes the physical inactivity? And that this is a reverse causality problem. Now, Floud et al. published a really fascinating paper in neurology this year, looking at this from the UK uh, women's study. Over a million women were in this study. <clears throat> Their hypothesis was that there could be a lot of reverse causality in dementia because dementia's got a long, long, preclinical history. So they hypothesize that if they looked at risk factors 20 years prior to the development of dementia, they would have a much more accurate estimate of the contribution of that risk factor to the development of dementia later on. And what they found was in their study that Basically, obesity was the one factor that came out because if you look at risk factors going back 20 years, physical inactivity and low caloric intake did not, did not seem to be significant or really not importantly significant. So the, the inference here is that we've got to be very careful with the observational epidemiology, that we're not looking at reverse causality. In other words, the dementia has caused the low caloric intake and the low physical activity. This, I happened to meet one of the authors of this paper who gave a presentation in Australia before COVID. And she told me that they had tremendous trouble getting this paper published because the dementia doctors didn't like this, which is an interesting observation. So let's look at some other data that you might not be aware of. So on this slide, you've got four graphs. A are people with a very good cognitive performance. B, low co lower cognitive performance. C is early dementia and D is late dementia. And the blue and the red and the green bars represent the neuropathology that you find if you look at these people's brains. Now, the first thing to point out is that A, A and B are not particularly different. And, that's a, that, and they are, but they are different if you test them. And the other thing to point out is, yes, in D, late dementia, there's a lot more neuropathology, but there's quite a bit going on. And also in A, the cognitively normal people, they've also got a lot of neuropathology. So this is a bit of a problem. brain group and others have published the epidemiology of dementia, the incidence and prevalence. And this is one of a few studies which have shown that the the good news is there is a cohort effect in dementia prevalence, is later born populations have a lower risk of prevalent dementia than those born earlier in the past century. 
So something that we're doing in the modern era is better for our brains. So let's summarize where we are so far. Alzheimer's neuropathology that was initially described in a 50 year old is common for those without dementia. Age specific prevalence is falling. The risk factors are actually hard to map to the neuropathology. You know, what, what is it in childhood adverse events, midlife deafness, social isolation? And some of these risk factors may be incorrect due to reverse causality, as we have illustrated with the difference in physical inactivity, which might be a reverse causality problem, and obesity, which does appear to be real. <clears throat> and then we've got the problem that all our dementia, Alzheimer's disease treatments have failed, all the trials have failed. And then late appeared. And when late, and I'll tell you what late is, appeared, my reaction was, oh, for heaven's sake, what is going on? <laughs> and late is this delightful title, limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. So you're going to tell me now that, why are you telling me this? Uh, Dr. Lindley, you know, this is clearly very rare boutique little problem that the dementia doctors have found. Well, that's not true. They think it could be half of what we've called Alzheimer's disease. Extraordinary, especially as you get older and frailer. So this to me was a real a wake up call. If, if, most of what, we, well, a lot of what we've called Alzheimer's disease is not even Alzheimer's disease. No wonder we've got ourselves in a bit of a mess. And then the thing that really uh, was a wake up call for me was the Wallace paper in Lancet Neurology last year. This to me is the most important medical publication I've seen in years, and I'm not exaggerating. And what this group have noted in their background is that some people with substantial Alzheimer's disease pathology at autopsy have shown few clinical symptoms of the disease, which if you think about it is that figure A, I showed you a few slides back in that neuropathology four figure slide. So what I want to do is just show you the key result table from this paper. And we're going to look at the neuropathological burden low. So these are people who've got low degree of pathology in the brain. And let's see how many of them have got dementia. Well, it depends on their frailty. If you've got low frailty, few of them had dementia. But if you go up to high frailty, 69% had dementia. This is extraordinary. So with the same burden of neuropathology in the brain, your clinical presentation of dementia depended on frailty, going up from 5% to 33% to 69%. Conversely, if you keep the frailty index at the same level, like this first column called low, and you then go up the neuropathological burden, your dementia went up from 5% to 30% to 67%. This is, to me, was a light bulb moment. So they summarized that, you know, for one in six people, there really was a very poor correlation between the symptoms and the Alzheimer's pathology. Stroke and heart failure were also related to dementia and the frailer the subject, the less able they are to tolerate dementia pathology. So we've talked about Alzheimer's vascular disease and we've mentioned Lewy body disease. But what about the other dementias? So I'm just going to 
give you a little little tour of the other dementias and I, I can't get you to shout out uh, the way we're doing this but you can just have a think yourself whether you know the dementia I'm talking about when I show you the picture so Terry Jones the python I don't know whether you knew his dementia but it was frontotemporal dementia so this is sort of perhaps number four in the list of popularity in the dementia top 10. This is head injury, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I love the old name, which is dementia pugilistica after the um, boxes. Now, some of you might recognize Robert Schumann, the composer, and he, the poor man, had syphilis, general paresis of the insane. Uh, you may think this is a disease. I see cases of syphilis in medicine from time to time. If you do the tests, you'll find them. Good old alcohol. Now, this is a little bit more difficult. You will recognize Einstein here. But you might not know that this is his son on the right and his poor son had schizophrenia and a lot of people with schizophrenia end up with dementia precox which is another form of dementia I like, again i like the old names so uh, we could go on um, uh, down syndrome huntington's aids kreutzfeldt yakov disease you might think that's exceptionally rare but I've personally seen two cases in the last 20 years in Australia. Lyme and pig disease, multiple sclerosis, progressive supranuclear palsy, the failures, radiation, delirium. We could go on. So coming back to modern day medicine, colleagues tell me, well, Professor Lindley, you're not actually that good dementia you're not a dementia researcher you told us that what we really need is careful neurological assessment by world experts someone like john hodges best expert in frontotemporal dementia so this is a study that he and gonda Halliday published some years ago and it's relevant to aphasia because of the the syndromes that you will be aware of semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia, non-fluent agrammatic variant, PPA, logopenic variant, PPA. And the, the, the sorts of um, pathology that we see. Now this is a group of a cohort of patients that John Hodges and his team had beautifully assessed. And I just want to draw your attention to panel C here in the red. So this is the, the people with the non-fluent agrammatic variant primary progressive aphasia. And a third of these people when they came to post-mortem actually had Alzheimer's disease. They didn't have frontotemporal dementia at all. And overall, 26% of these beautifully phenotype patients actually had Alzheimer's disease. The average age in this series was actually young, 60 to 70 years. But these authors were surprised that they couldn't distinguish the pathology um, based on the current diagnostic features. So with that background, three geriatricians, myself, Louise Waite and John Cullen, Louise and John running a very, very busy dementia service in Concord Hospital just down the road. The three of us met with Glenda Halliday's group as part of a sort of interest of frailty in dementia, part of the Sydney Dementia Network. And we decided we might try and um, put our hand above the parapet here and, and raise the, the need for discussion of a new paradigm shift. 
Now at the bottom of the slide, I've put the link to this paper, which you will see uh, in further slides. <coughs> and I've had a little personal campaign to promote this paper on social media. If you wish to do the same, that would be great. Uh, I've managed to get this paper with the highest altmetric score in the Australasian Journal on Aging so far, and so I'm very keen to continue. But what we have, what we have said in this paper is that, and this is our concept, the paradigm, that this is the probability of having a single cause for your dementia, and the x-axis is increasing age. And what we're saying is that the younger you are, the higher the probability you've got a single cause, cause for your dementia, such as the original case that Alzheimer's described with the 50-year-old lady. But as time goes on, the brain accumulates multiple causes for dementia. So by the time you get to see me, the geriatrician, as you're old and gray in C on the arrow, the probability you've got a single patholog pathological cause for your dementia is less than, less than 50%. And what we're arguing is that one of the reasons for the failure of the clinical trials is that most of the trials have been done around B, which has not been a pure trial cohort. And this is just to remind you that in our paradigm, Alzheimer's original patient would be an arrow A with a high probability of single pathological cause. When we actually think about the definition of dementia, it is actually a global brain problem. It's a syndrome with deterioration in memory, thinking and behavior that's affected the ability to perform everyday activities. So the very definition actually implies an accumulated deficit syndrome, not a specific disease. And obviously we describe the patient as having mild cognitive impairment when the activities of daily living are intact. But I would argue we've actually been using a, an accumulated deficit syndrome definition for dementia, and that's actually what it is. So my challenge to you is, does this frailty dementia paradigm, this accumulated deficit paradigm, fit with your aphasia work? And maybe aphasia is one of the many accumulated deficits that can contribute to dementia. And I really value the opportunity and to be able to discuss this new paradigm with you. When, I pub when we published this editorial in the Australasian Journal on Aging, I got a really nice response from the Halifax, Nova Scotia group, Ken Lockwood's group. And his simple message to me was, wow, someone gets us. And that was really good to understand that you know, the Wallace paper, the Lindsay Wallace paper in Lancet Neurology last year, his group in Nova Scotia, Halifax, think the same. We think, we agree, I say we, my three, the three of us who wrote the editorial, but having given this talk a few times in different audiences, I am finding that a lot of people find this a very attractive, paradigm. So very happy to uh, answer, answer some questions. And um, this is just a reminder to people that um, please have your adventure before dementia as a grey nomad. So I will um, hand back to Michelle uh, for the questions and look forward to hearing what some of you have to say about this. 
Thank you so much, Richard. What a stimulating presentation. We'll just get um, our Slido questions up from our attendees. Now, the first one here for us is, can frailty in the elderly be reversed? So example, post-acute illness. And if so, could this potentially reduce the presentation of dementia, do you think? Ah, oh, very good question. Um, it, frailty as an accumulated deficit, the way it's measured in the, in the Ken Rockwood method is potentially quite difficult to reverse. But there are, there are a few trials out there now that's, that are promising that we could perhaps make a difference to some other ways that you can measure frailty, um, you know, which is, includes methods of looking at, say, grip strength. So I think, I think that, that is certainly a really useful research question now is that can will tackling frailty and the prevention of frailty to, to do more to prevent dementia than some of our other approaches? Michelle, you're on um, you're on mute. Sorry, Richard. Can you see those <laughs> up again? Thank uh, you. I, I okay. Can. So the, the top question here is on cognitive stimulation therapy. What are your thoughts on this as a treatment approach to Alzheimer's? And does social stimulation need to be this structured? I have to honestly say I'm I'm not I'm not enough to give you an answer to that. Um, you know, one of the one of the worries that I have is that this the social you know social isolation as a potential cause of dementia could well be a reverse causality problem. That as you develop dementia, you just withdraw into your uh, uh, you know a, a smaller and smaller life space, and it's hard to know whether that sort of stimulation would reverse or be a treatment for Alzheimer's, but there is no doubt that anecdotally, when you can get the attention of people with dementia, you can certainly an animate people and they, you know, some of you may have seen that television program last year about the older people meeting the, the young children. And, you know, you see similar things with meeting pets and, um, if, if nothing else, it's a humane way of dealing with people with dementia. But whether it can treat the dementia or reverse some of the symptoms of dementia, I just don't know. Mm, okay, thank you. Next question asks, do you think pre-existing frailty also contributes to the differences in aphasia outcomes post-stroke? I'm sure they do. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the accumulated deficit paradigm would, would tell us that with an aphasic impairment, it's going to be far more difficult to get recovery if the rest of the brain is really in, the, in a poor state. You know, where are we going to get the plasticity of recovery? And I think, you know, that it, I see that clinically all the time. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea, for those questions. We've got a comment beneath that us um, saying, thank you for a great talk, Richard. How can we convey diagnostic and prognostic information better with family members and people with dementia themselves? You know, the, the thing that I find interesting is that um, there's some, there's some words that to be 
And I think, well, God, I pass people in the street. And there is this. Um, maybe it's because I'm a blunt governor from England. That <laughs> really, all about the diagnosis of dementia in the clinic. I sometimes think, in the way I'm dealing with uh, patients and their their family members. So, yes, you know, don't pussyfoot around. It, it use. It, Talk about what what the problem is. There's we have you know a memory problem, a dementia problem, and in the last couple of years, I've been having far more nuanced conversations about the causes because people come to me and say, "Oh, I want to." The GP said, "I've got to see you to get approval for dimepazole," and, and I say to them, "Well, I'm not a huge fan of dimepazole." but I can offer something that's probably as good. And that is, you know, a full assessment, full examination and a holistic sort out. And, you know, you get rid of the benzodiazepines, the sleeping tablets, the tranquilizers, you simplify the medication, get them clean, care, specialization, and you know, people seem to be a bit better. So, I talk to people about the, you know, when they say, well, what's the cause? And I say, well, I think for the frail people I see, I'm very honest. I say, it is likely there is more than one cause. You know, dad, as you know, drank heavily for 40 years. I think we can look at his brain scan and see the atrophy that that has resulted in. We can also see in the brain scan a few holes here from the strokes but he's probably also got some Alzheimer's. And, and then people start really understanding why there isn't a pill for dementia, because it's actually a lot more complicated than that. And you know, one of my great teachers here in Australia was Michael Price, and he had this wonderful phrase that, uh, you know, when you're talking to the patients, you and I need to get old together. I love that. I love that uh, phrase, and I, that's what I say to my patients, that um, you, know, you and I need to get old together, and should I see you in six months and see how we go? And the clinic, once you've got the diagnosis of, of dementia established and people are on an inevitable, often inevitable downward trajectory, the, the clinic then becomes problem solving. You know, every six months, there's usually something new that's popped up, perhaps a diff challenging behavior. Perhaps we need to stop them driving now. Uh, perhaps the most difficult thing of all is the move to residential care. So uh, I think that's how this, the, this paradigm informs the way I practice. Mm. Thank you so much, Richard. What an insightful response. And I love that, um, that image of growing old together. Um, we've got a question from our very own director, Miranda Rose, asking, is a long-standing history of severe migraine requiring medication a risk for dementia? She's seen several patients with fluctuating migraine-related aphasia. Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, Miranda trust you to ask me a difficult question. Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose what I'm talking about with this paradigm is that anything that's a deficit, an accumul a potentially accumulated deficit, be it recurrent migraine, be it the medication, I'm saying that that could well be a part of a dementia or a part of the brain not working. So I think all these things are very relevant. Mm. Another question asks, is there a correlation, or oh, sorry, if there is a correlation between primary progressive aphasia and Alzheimer's, 
do you find that usually the PPA is diagnosed first or the Alzheimer's? Good question. I think the, the issue here is the, the, the John Hodges study has demonstrated that people who present with a primary progressive aphasia could still have Alzheimer's disease. It's just the Alzheimer's pathology has localized in that part of the brain. Mm. Now, you often need a smart neurologist or geriatrician for the penny to drop that it's primary progressive aphasia, to be honest. Uh, and so getting an accurate phenotypic diagnosis is good. And, you know, I, I tell you, I'm not a dementia researcher. I'm a jobbing geriatrician dealing with dementia. But for my challenging cases, I send them to the Westmead Cognitive Clinic where they've got access to neuropsychology assessment as well and, and a more expert neurological opinion. And I find that very useful to get a second opinion. And I, and I think in medicine, it's, it's wise to not be too sure of your own abilities uh, and get a second opinion. Uh, that's not unreasonable. Yep. Okay. In treatment of patients with dementia, sometimes rehab is not pursued due to perceived capacity for learning. Mm. Does this need changing in regards to frailty then? Yeah, I, it, is a, it is a problem. Um, I've, I've spent my COVID months doing, concentrating almost entirely on geriatric rehabilitation. It just happened that when the, when the music stopped at the start of COVID, that's where I was working and we went geographic. So we stopped doing, the way we managed COVID in our service was that we became geographically based. And because I was doing the geriatric rehabilitation ward, that's where I've been based. And what we find is that um, it's very variable, to be honest. There are some people with a mild dementia who do very well with rehabilitation. And, um, you know, we're last chance rehab for these people. Uh, if we can't get them better, no one else is going to take them on. So if in doubt, it's worth giving them a try. Uh, I think, well, a lot, of, a lot, perhaps most of my patients have additional frailty. Mm. And, that, and you know what that means? It means they need a lot of time. And you know, weeks and months. So I think part of the work on the rehabilitation unit is the, is the multidisciplinary input. If people are thin, frail and wasted, they need uh, strengthening exercises, but also good nutrition and perhaps supplements to get, to get them above that threshold that's decompensated them. Absolutely. And there is a comment right down the bottom suggesting nutrition is so important and often mm -hmm. overlooked. Frailty is an indicator of poor prognosis. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I can't agree more that, uh, you know, we are what we eat. And um, this is, nutrition is, is really, really important. You know, I, I've got a patient at the moment who, when she came in, she was, she was short of virtually everything because she'd been sitting in a chair uh, and not really uh, looking after herself at all. And she was just about short of every vitamin, iron, you name it. We, we thought she might have something like celiac disease, but I think it really was an input problem with this particular lady. Mm. Perhaps all the worse worsened by the, the current um, COVID situation. Mm. Yeah. Now, we, we have another question here from um, Lucy. Thank you for, for this point. Via, um, sorry, are higher levels of education now compared to the past a protective factor for people? We think so, yeah. Um, and it may well be the fact we've tuned more of the brain to begin with, so you can lose more before you decompensate. So mm -hmm. it really is a very strong protective factor mm -hmm. so that could well be the case and um you know use it or lose it yep yep okay 
Um, somebody's saying they love the idea of a paradigm shift. So they're agreeing with you that the time is right to look Lovely. at a paradigm <laughs> to progress dementia research. <laughs> well, you know what, though? The problem is peer review. The, can I be really rude? You won't, you won't say, you won't pass this on to anyone important with you. But if you're, <laughs> a, if you're an Alzheimer's dementia doctor or you're a frontotemporal dementia doctor and you've been getting money to do your pathology for decades and you come across this upstart who thinks it's all to do with accumulated deficits how open are you going to be to fund that new project i i think there's going to be um, pushback here and i'm afraid to say I think there's also the subject is mired in financial conflicts of interest. Dementia doctors have sold the pharmaceutical industry that we can get a marker for Alzheimer's and then we can treat people early in the disease. And our paradigm suggests that that's got no chance of success. And that is not popular, I suspect, with certain parts of the very powerful dementia research community. So I think this is going to be a challenge. Mm. Yes, a candid reflection on some of the structural barriers that you might be observing, Richard. Thank you. Um, we've got a question again about frailty. What are your thoughts on increasing frailty and social isolation currently with COVID and the risks for our clients with dementia? Well, it's, you know, there are, going to be a lot of anticipated and unanticipated consequences of the, of the difference in way we're having to live at the moment. So I do worry, I do worry that we're going to see a cumulative at all, you know, late presentation of serious diseases like cancer, I think is a possibility. I think we might not, you know, I've not been able to do my new patient clinic easily. The last few months i've just started seeing people face to face again because of the, the difficulty in doing a full holistic geriatric medicine assessment by telemedicine uh, it's, it's it's pretty impossible you can do bits of medicine by telemedicine um, i've successfully followed up a lot of my patients with video conferencing but it's really hard to get to know a new person and you can't examine them from top to toe so I think we're going to have a, a backlog of people to assess and start getting into the system. Mm. And, and, you know, I'm, uh, part of my other academic life is I'm doing the respiratory virus research in public health with public health in the west of Sydney. And, and you know, we may be only at the beginning of COVID-19, I'm afraid. Um, the vaccine is not looking as if it's arriving very soon. And, you know, in the, in the, even in the worst affected countries, they've only got five or 10% of the population have had the disease so far. So you can imagine the carnage as it plows through the other 90% of the population. So we, you know, we might, we might be heading into a second wave in Australia, hopefully not, but if we do and we've got to socially isolate again this is going to have severe consequences for our vulnerable population and part of our work in health is to advocate for our vulnerable and uh, see what we can do absolutely well it's good to know that you're one of the people taking charge in this area richard um we've got a couple more questions that i'd love to to um put to you. Chelsea asks, do you see a difference in rehab outcomes in communication versus mobility in patients with dementia, given the cognitive learning processes that are involved in something like aphasia rehab? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a, good, a good point. Um, the, you know, the majority of aphasia I see in in the rehab is, is stroke patients, of course. Um, the 
the aphasia of dementia really is i don't think you can move that once people become aphasic or troublesome aphasia with their dementia that's it's really on a slippery slope um, but in terms of stroke aphasia we're seeing lots of interesting new uh, trajectories with thrombectomy of course where you can often rescue the cortex and see some remarkable improvements in people who starting off pretty aphasic but getting getting really good improvements because their cortex was saved with some um, thrombectomy so i think we can do lots still for aphasia and stroke but i really don't i don't see much we able to do with aphasia with the with the with the mainly predominant dementia syndromes underlying their deficit mm, okay Thanks for tackling that tricky question. Our lucky last one, again, looking at different links with dementia. Have the effects of chronic sleep deprivation been considered in, in dementia? There's emerging research um, out there suggesting this is critical. Yes, and i um, pleased to say my colleagues at University of Sydney are leading some of this work with Sharon May Smith. Well, you know, it sort of fits with the paradigm, doesn't it? Accumulated deficit. Mm. If, mm. if part of our sleep is to detox the brain through the glymphatic system, sleep deprivation could be a really important driver of getting a fragile brain, a frail brain. And it may, you know, you know the thing about Alzheimer's pathology is that, you know, my analogy when talking about this with colleagues and the students is that what if the tangles and plaques are just the rubbish that's put out at the end of the day you know <laughs> the damage the damage is done upstream and i think the sleep story is really interesting part of the upstream damage that might you know lead to tangles and plaques but tackling the tangles and plaques may not be the way to tackle the dementia of alzheimer's that's caused by for example, chronic sleep deprivation. So this is why I think the accumulated deficit model is attractive because it needs clearly needs a holistic approach, multifactorial approach. Thanks, Richard. And I have it on good authority from a colleague here at the Aphasia CRE that the CRE is looking at the relationship between pre-existing brain frailty and aphasia after stroke. So they're hoping to have some results to share very soon. Now, um, we will have to stop there for questions. Thank you so much, Richard, for taking all of those on. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you to our attendees for your participation in our seminar today.